And I just want to finish this last part before we go to the last section of the message. So this is how Paul carried out the ministry in Thessalonica. He had suffered much at Philippi. The life was threatened, beaten up and whatever else happened at Philippi. But he comes and he has not lost any of the enthusiasm bringing the word of God to the Thessalonians. And remember, he only had three Sabbaths there. And then he was routed out again, almost losing his life. But what kind of message did Paul leave with the Thessalonians? What kind of mark did he leave with the Thessalonians? And now we go to the second part of his message. The manner of his life. One of the most difficult things I've encountered as a pastor is who are you? What are you? You know, people see me in church Sunday and I'm dressed up in a uh, suit and tie and all that. And people say, wow, that is great. Uh, you know, many people know I'm not good looking, so I try my best. But uh, that's besides the point. The ba basic thing is, you look at a person one way, Sunday morning. But in the privacy of, of his life, who is he? What is he? And so why is this important for Paul when he writes back to the Thessalonian church? Because you see what Paul wanted them to first notice, that he himself was a believer. And what he was preaching came out the depth of his belief. Did not just come out an assignment to carry out. So we now come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, the manner of his life. Look what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. For you remember, brothers, of our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed the good news, the gospel of God. You say, well, why would that be important? Why does he have to even say that? You know, laboring night and day. Let's go back uh, and get something from history. Thessalonica was a metropolis. So much trade. It, it would be like the Hong Kong, the New York, and all those big places of today. You know, it even mattered what you put on your wrist. You know, if you walk somewhere and you're just wearing the Walmart brand watch, people look at it and say, not worth even giving in the second glance. But if somebody asks you the time and you pull your sleeves back and you said, um, this is the time, and the person says, is that Rolex? You say, yeah. What's the big deal about it? Whoa, all of a sudden the person knows you are a person of means because of what you wear on your wrist. You wish, you know, when you wear Rolex, it will kind of uh, strengthen your heart and make your heart function good. It doesn't do any of that. But just the wearing a watch with the name Rolex gives you a status differently because people think you are a person of means. Listen to what Paul is saying. He said, we came to you, we came to you as we proclaimed the good news to you, we labored and toiled for ourselves night and day. Why? Because we didn't want to be a burden to you so that the people in Thessalonica would know that this message was so important that it was not something that they brought so they could make a gain for themselves. And that is so important in today's world. You know, when I see some TV preachers calling for people, oh, you need to give more because of the great work we are doing uh, around the world and we're helping poor, poor people and orphans, the same time these preachers are living in a mansion. Now, you can ask me the question, are you jealous? 
Yes, I am jealous. Because how can you ask people to give more when you've got three, four mentions strewn all over the place? A million dollar worth of jet that you're flying in. Now, you know, if Paul came to Thessalonica on a thousands of dollars worth of chariot with the best horses money could buy at that time, I wonder how his message would go along. Well, he would sure capture the eyes of the rich and famous in that place. No, he came as a poor man, a working man, a toiling man. But the message he had was precious. And the few that saw the message and heard the message realized how precious this message was. You know, one time a man justified. He said, you know, I wear diamond rings on all my fingers, and I wear gold chain, and I wear the most expensive clothing. He said, that's the only way I can get attention from the rich and famous. Look at Jesus. What does Jesus say? The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has got no place to lay his head. And that is how he brought us the message, the good news, to save our souls. And guess what Paul does? He follows in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. You see, he did not desire to be a burden, so he worked to support himself. You see, that was a place where people went after the big bucks in Thessalonica. What does Paul do? He goes out and he labors to show the Thessalonians that he did not come looking for wealth. He came to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means he did not pollute the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to the Thessalonians. And that is why this church, after three Sabbaths of Paul uh, witnessing to them, would stand with such power and grace in the face of persecution, and their testimony would go beyond and above and from Macedonia even to Achaia. You see, and Paul makes it very clear to them, not that it was inappropriate for preachers to be supported. He does not say that the preachers should not be supported. He makes it very clear. First Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 6. Um, you know, it's very clear what, what Paul will say. And then from verses 15 to 18, he will go on to say, verses 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse uh, 15, he'll say, But I have made no use of these rights, nor am I writing this thing to secure any such provisions, for I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me, woe to me, if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not my own will, I am still entrusted with the stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. You see, Paul was so determined that the purity of the gospel would come to the Thessalonian church, and that's where he stood, and that's the stand he took. And guess what? The purity of the gospel captured the hearts of people. You see, so Paul often worked as a tent maker while preaching. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 4, very clear to see that. Uh, what the word tells us. In Acts chapter uh, 18, verses 1 to 4, and I'm reading this text because I just hate to, uh, when we preachers throw so many verses at you, and many of them are just out of context. But let me just read Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. 
because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath to try to persuade Jews and the Greeks. Isn't it amazing that Paul did not think first about his belly, what he thought about was the souls of men. And that was the power of the message that's going to come to the Thessalonians. And it was in the power of that message that it would go out further and further because of what they had learned from Paul. And then we see his example should remind us of the sacrificial nature of our service. And at this point I've got to say to some of my brethren in this church, it amazes me the sacrifice you bring to this church in your service to our Lord and God. Thank you for that. Some of you have just stepped down from some of the services you've given to this church as your term is up and you've let others step in. And boy, it requires time, it requires energy, it requires all of you, and some of you have done that. You see, we get that right from Scripture, and Paul's example should remind us of the sacrificial nature. You know, some may choose to support themselves like Paul did. All should be available and accessible both night and day to serve the Lord. Lord, also that we can serve by praying night and day. Some of you I know are not able to be here with us. Some of you, because of the health reasons, you are not able to come and serve in person. But I know that you are taking time to pray. Your service to this church and to Jesus Christ is more needful than you can even think or imagine. And I can tell you, God sees this as a service to him. Paul did it. Paul did it. And so we need to do it too. You see, the main point is that our service to God and one another is not a nine to five job. Some people think, well, pastor, you only preach once a Sunday and all that. And my goodness, you got a six days off. Yes, sometimes it's a joke that we only preach one hour um, a week. But can I tell you, because you don't understand the nature of work, I do not know when not to be a pastor. Ask my family and they'll tell you. Because many a times they are robbed of that energy. And sometimes it's my own work ethic that is stupid at times that I don't know when to express myself. But I'll tell you what, when you're a pastor, it's a 24, uh, seven days a week responsibility. But not only does Paul tell us the manner of his life, laboring day and night, he tells us how he did it, devout, just, and blameless. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, you are witnesses and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. Wow. I mean, when I come to this verse, it's frightening. Paul saying, you are witnesses and God also. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. That means... Said, wait a minute, Paul, are you touting, are you blowing your own horn? No, because that was the reality and that was the truth. Today I see, and forgive me, uh, I'm, I'm included in the number, I see us fellow pastors and I see our lifestyle and what we say in private and how we live in private. No wonder the gospel does not go out in power and grace as he did in uh, the time of Thessalonians.